Welcome back to the second day of our annual educational conference. I'm Tim Brigham, the uh, Chief of Staff and Chief of Education at the ACGME. And I'd like to welcome you to what we think is going to be a really, really fantastic day, um, full of opportunities for you to learn something, full of opportunities for you to teach each other, and full of opportunities for you to connect. We'd like to begin today with our president's plenary. Uh, this is always an eagerly awaited event uh, where we can learn and grow from the insights and wisdom of Dr. Thomas Naska. Um, prior to Dr. Naska speaking, I'd like to introduce um, the chair of our board, uh, Dr. Karen Nichols, who will introduce Dr. Naska. Uh, Dr. Nichols, uh, as you may know, recently retired as the Dean of Midwestern University Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. She served in that capacity for 16 years years. Um, I'd like you to take a look. Uh, I won't go through her entire bio. Her entire bio is in your conference materials. But if you read that, you'll find a woman who has, who has accomplished so much in her life. She has accomplished, she has gotten many honorary degrees. She's gotten many awards. She has been the first in many, many, many arenas, the first woman, the first osteopath in, in different places. What I'd like to do, however, is uh, is introduce you to someone who's not in that bio, um, who's, not, uh, who's not listed there, the remarkable person behind the words. Uh, she is, as I said, a remarkable person whose accomplishments only tell part of her story. She's exceptionally gifted in a number of ways. She's a gifted teacher, mentor, leader, and a visionary. When, and I'm not gonna say if, when you have the privilege to be in her presence, you will be touched by a bit of magic and grace. She's among the finest, most compassionate and caring people I've ever met in my life. Um, there are two pieces that are really important for us to introduce to you that are not in her bio in our, in our conference material. As you know, we just recently um, completed the integration of two separate accreditation systems into a single accreditation system. Dr. Nichols is the first representative of the other stream of accreditation to be the chair of our board. She is the first osteopathic chair of the ACGME board. And during the, her tenure, her entire tenure as chair of the board, has been, do, has been uh, done during the pandemic, where we have not been able to gather together uh, to, to break bread, to connect with one another as a board in order to serve the mission of the ACGME, which is to serve the public's healthcare needs. She has been the glue. She's the epoxy resin that has brought us together and stuck us together so that our board, um, can inspire our administration and our staff to follow that North Star, to follow the star that we're all going towards. She is the leader of that event. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to a remarkable woman, our first osteopathic chair, the glue and epoxy resin of the ACGME, Dr. Karen J. Nichols. Welcome to the 2022 Annual Educational Conference of the ACGME. I'm Dr. Karen Nichols, I'm the chair of the board, and it's my privilege to introduce our opening plenary. It opens the conference and it sets the tone. It gives you insight, perspective, big picture, great way to start it. And it's my privilege to introduce the president and CEO of the ACGME, Dr. Thomas J. Naska. Now there is no speaker better known than at this conference than Dr. Naska. He has led in every facet of graduate medical education. He's a highly sought after speaker. His CV includes actually thousands of presentations and he has hundreds of publications. So he's noted for his insight. He gives thoughtful consideration and interesting perspectives on what's happening in medical education and what we should consider. 
So the, there's a long list of honors and awards that he has received both from the MD and the DO sides of the traditions of medicine. Now he's been president and CEO of ACGME for nearly 15 years. And he is a really unique and rare combination of the visionary and the operations specialist. He sees the big picture and he comprehends what it's gonna to take to get that done. So what motivates him? He has a, gen a genuine heart for patients and for medical education. And let me read a quote. He received an honorary degree from Georgetown University in May of 2018 and gave an address to the graduates of the medical school. And this is what he said. Every patient has a why. We need to listen. We need to hear it so we can help them with the how so that they can achieve it. Your soul will be enriched by each person you care for. Pursue your calling with vigor, with commitment, with kindness. And whenever in doubt, remember the why that's in your heart today. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Thomas J. Nasca, President and CEO of the ACGME. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ACGME Annual Education Conference. My name is Tom Nasca, and I'm here to uh, bring you back to basics and speak about graduate medical education in the era of COVID-19. It is my deepest hope that next year we'll be doing this in person. By way of disclosure, I retain my faculty appointments without compensation at both Jefferson as well as the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine. I'm the chair of the board of directors of the ACGME International. I sit on no other boards except no honorary and I have no conflicts of interest to report and my slides will be available to you. Today, I'd like to frame my discussion in, uh, in the terms of the three pandemics that we've been dealing with. The first is the opioid epidemic uh, and the, the, the loss of life that we have seen at epidemic proportion in the United States. The second is a topic that I introduced to you last year in this uh, discussion, the five eyes pandemic of inequity, intolerance, incivility, incoherence, and inhumanity. And finally, I want to spend a fair amount of time speaking about COVID-19 and the impact on medical education superimposed on the parallel pandemic of clinician burnout, depression, and loss of well-being. Now, all of us are aware of the challenge that the opioid uh, epidemic uh, poses to us. Uh, we see here the graphic of the rise in opioid deaths, the latest phase uh, uh, caused uh, to great extent by uh, the synthetic opioid component of the opioid crisis. And the a startling and alarming number that overdoses of any cause uh, were 28.1 per 100,000 in 2020 during the height of the pandemic. This infographic from the CDC and HHS uh, gives us some indication of the severity of this problem. With 93,000 deaths from overdose in the year 2020, hidden behind the challenges that we were facing with the pandemic. Now, in contrast, two years ago, when we spoke about this at great lengths uh, and lamented the circumstance, we have some solutions in hand uh, from an educational perspective to move the ball forward in the fight against the opioid crisis and overdose deaths. Uh, the first is uh, a, uh, a publication by the National Academy of Medicine uh, that we participated in, uh, educating together and improving together an interdisciplinary approach to uh, developing competency in pain management and substance use disorder management. We had a, uh, a stakeholders conference uh, in GME uh, hosted uh, by the ACGME in the spring of last year uh, with two days of virtual discussions around the key elements that requ are required in our curricula specialty by specialty 
All of this information and more is available on the ACGME website. Uh, if you type in opioid crisis uh, and search on that on the website, you'll come to a page that provides you these links and many others to information that will aid you in designing and implementing and evaluating the effectiveness of curricula and competencies in your residents and fellows with regard to this very important topic. Now, I spent some time last year speaking about the Five Eyes pandemic, and uh, uh, unfortunately, little has changed other than in some circumstances, uh, we may be seeing even more in humanity. The Ukrainian crisis has uh, brought um, violence and death to a scale that we thought unimaginable anymore in the civilized world. My only solution uh, is for all of us to become the change that we want to see in the world. And I'll speak a little bit more about this at the end of my presentation. So let's get back to basics and talk about the national GME effort, the impact of COVID-19 on our effort and the road forward, especially and most importantly in the spring of 2022. So what about the GME effort? Well, let's start at the sponsoring institution level. And here you can see that over the last six years, the number of sponsoring institutions has grown by about 9%. Um, a, a striking growth in a period where we thought the GME complement was relatively mature. If we look at it on a percentage basis, there is also some insight uh, as to the development and, and movement of organizations in their growth as GME enterprises. You can see we continue to have new organizations come in who have no yet, yet no sponsored programs because they need to achieve um, institutional or sponsoring accreditation first. One of the interesting phenomena we're seeing is over this period of time, the number of single program institutions are dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of five program or less institutions is growing, as is the number of six to 25 program resident complement institutions. These are very striking and important growth because many of these are not large teaching institutions and they are, they are found in areas that may need a diverse uh, production of specialists to meet local needs, especially in rural or suburban areas. Now, what about program growth? We have two phenomena operative on this slide. And the first you can see, and this is 2009 to 2021, and this light blue bar, a portion of the bar are um, a residency program applications and the red are subspecialty program applications. You can see we had a relatively constant production rate of new core programs of somewhere between 50 and 100 per year with somewhere between 200 and 250 subspecialty programs per year. The boost then here we see is the the uh, actualization of the single accreditation system with the application of core programs and subspecialty programs, many fewer subspecialty than core, of the, our osteopathic colleagues uh, to ACGME accreditation. And that total is about 744 applications with 711 of those programs ultimately being accredited. What is very interesting though is even at the end of and after the single accreditation system was completed, we see a doubling of core program applications on an annual basis, even into the pandemic, such that over 40% of the new program applications are core residency programs. This predicts continued growth in the pipeline, which we think is very important to absorb the continuing growth of undergraduate medical education in the United States. If we look closer at these applications, you can see, and here we long established disciplines, meaning disciplines that we've accredited for longer than five years. You can see that established disciplines have grown dramatically and remained elevated during the 2021 academic year. The new disciplines, and these are by definition almost always new subspecialties, uh, had a peak. Uh, in 2017, that was the shift of OBGYN subspecialties 
from ABMS uh, accreditation to ACGME accreditation. Uh, but you can see that the majority of uh, these applications coming out of the single accreditation system are for existing disciplines, many of them, over 200 of them on an annual basis, residency programs. And again, here you see the applications of the, the osteopathic programs to the ACGME peaking in 2016, 2017 time period with very few in 18 and 19 and none thereafter. The net result of this then is a significant and continued sustained growth in subspecialty programs and a recent acceleration in growth of core residency programs, such that approximately 615 of the 1166 program growth from the baseline back in 2001 uh, were osteopathic core residency programs and about 96 of the 1300 growth uh, in subspecialty programs or osteopathic programs. Now, what about matriculants? You can see the sustained growth of all components, three major components of our constituency in graduate medical education. US LCME accredited uh, uh, um, medical school graduates have grown from 15,900 to uh, over 20,000 over the 20 year period of time. International graduate pool has continued to gradually grow. It dipped slightly earlier in this last decade, but now has had sustained growth in the highest number of international graduates matriculating last year, almost 7,800. And here we see the osteopathic growth uh, up until 2015 divided between ACGME accredited training programs and AOA accredited training programs, but now fully AO, ACGME accredited training programs. So we see the totality of the graduating pool of 6,700 osteopathic graduates and that pool continuing to grow uh, for the next few years in anticipation of plateauing mid uh, this next decade. So the cumulative impact of all of those growth figures is a dramatic growth in the resident complement entering the pipeline from 24,000 roughly to nearly 35,000 in 2021. And we can see this um, in a percentage increase with the specific numbers uh, in each year in the linear graph. This blue line is core residency with a 44% increase and we see literally a doubling in the number of entry fellowship positions occupied in ACGME programs over the last 20 years. Now, not all of the residency program pipeline entry level position increase is a true increase. Approximately 2000 of those positions are a shift from AOA to ACGME accreditation and when accredited by AOA, we're not part of our resident complement, but here you can see that they're layered on top. So we have about a 35.7% increase in the true pipeline positions uh, from 2001 to 2021. Now, similar to entry level positions, our graduating numbers continue to rise on an annual basis from 33,000 in 2005 to 46,500 in 2020. And you can see the resident in blue and the fellow graduation numbers in red. The pipeline to clinical practice approximates the resident complement line uh, with the fellowship graduation pool merely representing resident graduates from a few years before. So they're not additive when we enter into the net impact on the pipeline. And this graphic is um, interesting to me, especially based on an article written in the Atlantic not uh, too long ago, indicating that the profession was preventing the growth of uh, physicians to serve the American public intentionally. 
what you can see here is that in uh, 1991, there were uh, about 550,000 physicians serving the American public or licensed to serve the American public. And last year, there were 1,018,000 physicians. For a physician to population ratio of licensed physicians to population of 214.7 in 1991 and 307.8. So not only has our resident complement translated into more graduates and translated into more licensed physicians, it has grown more rapidly than the population in the United States. And so the ratio of physician to population continues to grow. And this is the degree complement of those uh, uh, physicians, licensed physicians from 2010 to 2020. And this is FSMB data published in the Journal of Medical Regulation. And you can see that the osteopathic pool of physicians, licensed physicians has grown uh, nearly doubling over that period of time, over a decade. And the allopathic physician growth at 128,000, three times that of the osteopathic community, but on a percentage basis, significantly lower. Now this relationship I, I call to your attention because I think it's very important for us to recognize if we are truly um, uh, intending to serve the American public in all of its locations and in the best way that we can. This is um, active clinicians, in other words, 20 hours in clinical practice or more, which number about 9, 940,000 uh, when looked at per 100,000 population versus on the x-axis, total residents and fellows per 100,000 population by state. And what you can see is a pretty predictable linear relationship between the number of residents and fellows in a given state and the number of practicing physicians per unit of population. This, a similar relationship holds for programs, number of accredited programs per 100,000 in population mm -hmm. per state. Uh, the inset on both of these graphics has been the complete data set because we have one outlier here. This is Washington, DC, where there are about 20 um, residency or fellowship programs per 100,000 and a physician to population ratio approaching 900. So that is the totality of the graphics. Now this is information about our effectiveness in producing board certified physicians. One of our goals in ACGV is to produce board certified physicians to serve the American public. That is the social contract and the public trust that we have is as a profession to produce the next generation to serve the needs of the public. We have never uh, had this data in the past. We've known first year, first time take and pass rates uh, for board certification examinations, but we've never uh, uh, had access to nor presented to you uh, pass rates uh, ultimately achieved by our graduates. In order to understand that, we uh, chose a window of seven years after graduation, which is the eligibility period for ABMS certification, uh, as the window uh, to sample uh, the population who graduated seven years ago then and look at their pass rate. So in 2011, 2012, 2013, we had graduating classes of 35,500, 36,700, and 37,800. Uh, and we had board certification rates in each of those years across all graduates of 88.7, 87.5, and 89.1% for an aggregate of about 40, 80, pardon me, 88.47%. If we look at graphically and separate three groups, the US LCME graduates, the US COCA graduates, and all other graduate medical education that would include international graduates and US international graduates, you see that the pass rates, ultimate pass rates for all three groups are nearly identical. They are separated by less than one and a half percent, again, with an ultimate pass rate of 88.47%. So what should be our 
ultimate certification goal? The answer to that right now, I think at least in my mind is, I don't know the answer. Because we, not all physicians who graduate GME practice medicine at the bedside. Not all who graduate from graduate medical education seek board certification. And individual board standards and expectations are not identical. In other words, ultimate certification rate by specialties vary. So we have work to be done to understand what the target should be. Our goal ultimately though, should be to optimize ultimate certification because that's in the best interest of the patients that we serve. Now, what about accreditation outcomes? Are more programs, for instance, receiving adverse accreditation decisions during the pandemic? That's a question that I receive frequently. Well, in order to examine that question, we first need to um, set the frame. The next accreditation system, which was implemented in 2012-13 uh, period of time, uh, is, has a premise. And that premise is that continuous observation and feedback of programs and to programs and by programs will enhance accreditation outcomes. And this is the so-called balanced quality improvement and quality assurance paradigm of an accreditor. So how does this loop start? Well, we provide you and you take advantage of tools to identify areas for improvement. You do an annual program evaluation, you review your resident and faculty surveys, you review your milestone and clear data. You have institutional oversight and institutional evaluation, and you've received a residency review committee evaluation, perhaps citing areas for improvement or citations, or perhaps you received accreditation with warning. It is your responsibility then to synthesize solutions, to identify opportunities to achieve excellence, and to innovate with solutions for identified areas of improvement. You implement those solutions, and then you have your annual residency review committee assessment and the circle turns again. The goal here is not just satisfaction of minimum standards, however, the goal is ultimately achievement of the best educational outcomes and um, the best educational well-being of your graduates as can be achieved with the ultimate goal of serving the public need. So with that in mind, then let's look at the accreditation outcomes since 2007. In this slide, in the light bars, this is specialty or residency program accreditation. I'll separate that from fellowship and show you fellowship separately in a second. You can see that in the light blue bars, a specialty continued accreditation is uh, the, the mode of all programs. Uh, but you see this increasingly slightly darker blue, which is initial accreditation. And this is a manifestation of the increase in the number of applications that we have received for residency training, continuing well beyond that of the uh, introduction of osteopathic programs in the single accreditation system to the next accreditation system. At the very top of these bars, you see yellow, red, and black components. Let's look closer at that few percentage. This is that same subgroup exploded here with the y-axis being 6%. Uh, and in red, probationary accreditation in dark blue, withdrawal of accreditation, and in yellow, warning, which is not an adverse accreditation decision, but is now a formal status in the, in the new uh, accreditation model implemented in 1213. And what you can see is a progressive drop over time in the number of programs with withdrawal of accreditation. A little bump here, and that was the terminal decision of some small number of osteopathic programs who were not able to ultimately achieve ACGME accreditation. And uh, small numbers of programs on uh, probation, 0.3%, 0.2%, 0.3%, averaging 0.3%, with about 2.5% of programs uh, having warning status, indicating either recurrent citations or significant citations that the RRC wishes the program to fix rapidly. Um, this 
should give rise to a, an ablation of the myth that if residents tell the truth, their programs are going to go on uh, probation. Uh, adverse accreditation sis, uh, decisions are rare and are for egregious violations. Program may receive warning if they're having trouble and their residents disclose to us that there are challenges or the faculty disclose to us that challenge. But there's no reason to fear honesty on the resident survey because the review committees have adopted an improvement methodology and we expect that the programs adopt an improvement methodology. And I would believe as a former program director that I would wanna know early rather than later that I have a problem to fix. Now, when we look at subspecialty programs, the graphics look just a little bit different, especially with regard to the initial accreditation bar. And the reason for that is twofold. The first is we have larger numbers on an annual basis every year of subspecialty than core program applications. So the pool is larger for initial accreditation. And in addition, sometimes these programs will stay on initial accreditation a little bit longer uh, because the, they would like to see these programs fill out. Uh, frequently, they are receive their initial accreditation with no trainees, and we like to see those programs a little longer uh, before uh, issuing continued accreditation. And when we go to that top group, we see a similar phenomenon muted somewhat because there are very few programs even on warning from a subspecialty perspective. And again, uh, fewer than um, 0.6% of programs receiving adverse accreditation decisions in any year uh, since we have stabilized the, the next accreditation system. So ACGME by the numbers, uh, the GME effort in the United States continues to grow and the growth is reflected in the number of licensed physicians and is greater than the growth of the population. So the physician population ratios are growing. We are moving to meet those needs. Geographic distribution continues to be important though, and we need to bolster those states and, and regions that have lower physician to population ratios. ACGME graduates achieve about an 89% ultimate board certification rate. Uh, I would love to see that number higher. I don't know what the optimal is, uh, but our goal should be to optimize it. ACGME program accreditation success. In other words, your success in accreditation is outstanding. And annual review to, with feedback to programs is resulting in rapid remediation of citations. I can, I can tell you that we have studied that and that is indeed correct. Probationary accreditation, withdrawal accreditation are less frequent than they are under the old system. And the pandemic has not resulted in an increase in adverse accreditation decisions to this point. And finally, the pandemic, at least to date, has not yet slowed the expansion of graduate medical education. So we need to next ask you the question uh, of how you're dealing with the fraying of the social contract. And this, this graphic, I think, um, in, in, in a single graphic may uh, exemplify how many of your residents and fellows and faculty and staff feel uh, during, especially during this last six to nine months. I just want to say to you uh, once, and I will say it again at the end of this presentation, that each of you, your residents and fellows, your faculty and staff, your graduates and your colleagues, remain steadfast and demonstrated altruistic professionalism under the most challenging of circumstances and for the profession and for the country from a public health perspective to be seen in more than a century. I want you to please accept our gratitude and respect, the gratitude and respect of the entire profession and that of the vast majority of those we serve in the public for each of your efforts to uphold our promise and strengthen the social contract and the public trust that is uh, the profession of medicine in the United States. I will tell you though, and I think you know this, your effort comes at a price. And there are many debts that have been incurred, one of which I'd like to examine with you today and pledge to repay. That debt 
we have to society and our residents and fellows is to prepare them to serve the public in the future. Now, what I'm going to speak about now is my synthesis. It comes from many, many different places and uh, an incomplete list is here on this slide. Uh, but I uh, will present to you my impression of where we are, what has happened, and what we need to do. Let's start with some data from the annual program update last summer. In the previous academic year, almost half of the programs reported significant disruptions. Most were for one to three months, but 5% or over 500 programs had more than six months of significant disruptions. And the largest of those groupings were internal medicine, emergency medicine, family medicine. No surprise uh, in, in, for those of you who were involved in caring for patients during the pandemic. Generally, the direct impact was greater on residency than fellowship programs, but the indirect impact was felt throughout graduate medical education. Disciplines and programs were affected variably. We saw increases in demand for, with admissions for COVID, ICU coverage, emergency department consultations by many services, virtual didactic conferences and other educational techniques. But we saw, also saw decreases in ambulatory clinical visits. We saw increases in uh, remote visits on telemedicine, but decreases in in-person visits, elective and emergent surgical procedures, uh, and uh, procedural discipline, uh, operative and non-operative procedures were diminished. Elective rotations were diminished or lost by many residents. In-person didactic conferences were lost to a great extent. Informal and peer-to-peer -peer fa and family interactions were significantly changed and in some cases completely absent. Now, what about the health effects of the pandemic? And this is, uh, the first four months of the pandemic, March uh, through June of 1920, early in 2020, and then the academic year 2020-21. What you can see is that in both 1920 and 2021, we had significant percentages of programs reaching 50% in 2020-21 um, uh, with uh, at least one resident quarantined in a program. And uh, almost 800 programs had more than 10 residents quarantined during the academic year. There were 177 programs with at least one resident hospitalized, and there were four programs that had more than 10 residents hospitalized in 2021. And over the first 16 months of the pandemic, we lost 10 residents uh, to COVID. Now, what about the impact on faculty? Well, again, 40% of programs in last year had uh, uh, at least one faculty member quarantined and 4% or 527 had at least one faculty member hospitalized. And here the toll uh, in lives lost is even greater than in residents. 69 programs reported loss of one or more faculty members in 2021 and 46 in 2020, so a minimum 115 faculty members uh, lost to death related to COVID. 171 programs extended training for at least one resident or fellow specifically due to COVID-19 last academic year. And the largest number of extensions, uh, not surprisingly, were in internal medicine and family medicine. The educational program disruption and infection complications of the virus are just two of the impacts of the pandemic on our residents and fellows, and I think we need to look even in a broader way at the impact. We're all used to seeing this graphic of the number of cases with a, a y-axis of 800,000 cases and this dramatic Omicron spike coupled with the Delta spike and the original virus spikes. Um, and just the original, this is a national graphic, so the spike in the Northeast, especially in the New York, Connecticut, New Jersey area, 
uh, grossly uh, 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 underestimated there. I find this graphic to be very helpful, and I'll use it again in a little while, uh, to show you the potential impact uh, because of the hospitalizations and the hospitalization to intensive care unit and, and the percentage of patients who are in, in the intensive care unit who are admitted for COVID reaching a high during the Delta surge of 25% of the admissions needing ICU care um, being very striking. And of course, the striking excess death. This is the excess deaths occurring in the first year of the pandemic. Um, and if we look at excess deaths in two ways, excess deaths beyond COVID, about uh, 200,000, 216,000 in the first two years of the pandemic. Uh, this is uh, uh, February 1st of 2020 to, February, to, uh, to uh, January 31st of 2022. Compared to the previous six years, you can see 216,000 or a total including COVID at the end of January of over a million uh, 67,000 excess deaths over the baseline deaths in the United States. I wanna spend a minute emphasizing the magnitude of these surges in deaths. These are the rolling seven day average deaths and the rate of death uh, during the peak last winter if it were extended over the course of a year, would be at a rate of 1.1 million deaths per year. That is a striking, striking number. And I want to link it now to professional identity formation. We're all very aware, uh, uh, familiar with, and we actually, uh, uh, on a daily basis, participate in this movement uh, of young physicians as third year medical students from peripheral participation in medical care through graded authority and responsibility throughout graduate medical education to full participation in clinical care and achievement of independent practice. At the same time, young individuals, uh, altruistic motivated individuals come into medicine with an existing personality and identity and they are socialized and professionalized through a community of practice with the written and hidden curriculum within a clinical learning environment. And they become uh, new people. They have new personal and professional identities and they are molded by this environment. Now, what happens when that environment includes death on a scale that we have seen over the last two years? What happens when most of the training of a clinician is during this critical period of time when the environment has so changed? I can personally tell you that I remember vividly the worst day in my residency training and fellowship training to be December 25th, 1975, the day that I presided over uh, 15 cardiac arrests and 13 deaths. I remember a day this day more than 50 years late, oh, nearly 50 years later. Um, our residents and fellows have been exposed to that magnitude of death on a routine basis during these surges. It will have an impact on them. And it will have an impact and has had an impact on all of us because the clinical learning environment not only affects residency training, it affects undergraduate medical education, and it affects all of us in clinical practice. All of us have had our identity modified in some way. The concern is that the most young and impressionable and forming identity will have had it affected in an adverse way. Now, all of you are aware of this very important graphic and, and it's foundational in understanding how we cope with tragedy. Uh, but it, this is about the emotional highs and emotional lows that we experience in a disaster circumstance. When we have a warning or a threat, there is an increasing anxiety uh, that develops as whether we will be capable of handling the impact. The impact occurs and we see this quasi heroic response 
the honeymoon with co community cohesion, and then a period of disillusionment, and then some return and re to resolution and reconstruction and a new beginning. An important element that of our circumstance that differs from this is that this time course here is a one year anniversary. It's a one year cycle. And the second is that it's a single impact. And I would posit to you that we've not had a single impact and we certainly have been involved in this for more than a year. So again, if we look at this graphic of hospitalized patients and in the intensive care unit as a surrogate for the impact of the clinical learning environment on all of us, and we look at enhanced or depleted collective physical and emotional reserve of our faculty and our residents, what you can see is, um, I think, a, a phased phenomenon. We were all anxious in the early on, would there be enough PPE? And indeed there wasn't. Do we have enough ventilators? And we probably did. To this phase of altruism unleashed, everyone calling healthcare workers, in quotes, heroic. And uh, this cumulative impact of the workload gradually eroding our physical and emotional well-being, producing emotional exhaustion. And then in the, that heightened to its, its maximum in that phase around the holidays last winter. And then we had the advent of the vaccine and there was a euphoria that we might be at the beginning of the end. We were seeing cases drop, hospitalizations drop and increasing vaccine rates and then it plateaued. And we went through early and mid-summer at sort of a holding pattern, and we started to see Delta move from other parts of the world to the United States, and then Delta in earnest in the United States. And the other phenomenon that happened is the moral injury twofold of the public's attitudes, especially those who were being hospitalized, the non-immunized, even denying that they had COVID as an illness, uh, and angry at, um, at not only the residents and faculty, but the nurses and everyone else involved in their care. And the moral injury of seeing that much death and destruction, which would have been preventable by an immunization. And then of course, the abyss that we entered into after the holidays this year with Omicron and now cautiously coming out of that nadir in our emotional state hoping that we have seen the worst of this pandemic. What I'd like you to do, and I've shifted the frame now to include next year's academic year beginning, because I want you to think of all of that as the background for what we have in front of us this spring. I want you to begin by thinking about PGY1s entering into GME this academic year. Their third year, would have been significantly disrupted by the initial phases of the pandemic, as would have been their physical diagnosis at the end of their second year. Their fourth year would have been disrupted by Delta and by Omicron. And so they will come to us with a cumulative educational experience that is both variable with risks of idiosyncratic deficits in experience. By idiosyncratic, I mean unique to the individual because their rotation schedule, as well as their, the pandemic would have been variables in the nature of the educational experiences either postponed or altered. Now we're fortunate that we anticipated this problem last year and we produced a transition in a time of disruption monograph along with our colleagues at, the, at ACOM, AAMC and ECFMG and FAMER uh, that provided a, a systematic way for you to prepare to receive PGY1s who may not have been traditionally prepared to enter residency training, especially in your discipline. They may not have had the electives and other experiences to round out their ex experience as a fourth year medical student to prepare them to enter GME training. What I can tell you is that this uh, is current uh, in the sense that it was produced last year. It is being updated. There are small elements, including 
some uh, letters and essays by medical students and residents that will be updated for this year. Uh, but the, the last year's is still on our website and is available to you to start your preparations for your PGY1s. It is important that we anticipate that they will not have the same skill set as we would have traditionally thought of in the future. And I want to warn you that it's important to avoid making decisions based on performance in the first two months of a residency program for PGY1s under these circumstances. The heterogeneity in preparation will not be predictive of performance and performance predictive in the first two months of the rest of their performance as a PGY1. One should not preform um, or bias one's subsequent evaluations based on performance in the first few months. We must take a formative approach with feedback and customized growth to assist these individuals to reach their potential. Now, what about residents entering their final year in 2022? These are residents who have had significant portions of their training in the COVID period, but have a year with which to round out and rectify any experiential learning opportunities that are required if you create an individual learning plan for them on graduation. I would remind you that if you are the program director of a three-year residency program, say internal medicine, the current penultimate GME year, your PGY2s or PGY1s the previous year were the medical students who volunteered to graduate early and who have for their entire residency been immersed in care of COVID patients. There is significant work that we need to do to optimize their educational experience during academic 2022-23, and it may not be just a standardized schedule. And that creativity really lies at the level of the program, the clinical competency committee, the program director, and the resident in figuring those things out, because those, those opportunities for rounding out of their experiences are essential. Now, here's an example of uh, a resident who uh, graduated last year, arrives in their fellowship with some potential uh, deficits in their internal medicine third year training because of loss of elective time, for instance, in covering intensive care units uh, during that first bad winter that we had. Uh, and they matriculated into a nephrology fellowship. And in their F1 nephrology fellowship, lo and behold, in the middle of the year, uh, their fall and winter rotations were dramatically disrupted because of Delta and Omicron. So their inpatient consultative service experience would be dramatically different if they had it in the summertime, last summer, versus January, February, and March, similarly for all the other rotations. So at the fellowship level, F2 fellows need to have these needs met. For instance, in traditional internal medicine subspecialties, the second year is a research year. It may well be that additional clinical experience may be required in order to round out the clinical training of a fellow with such an experience. And again, fellowship program directors, clinical competency committees, and the fellow need to work together to understand where those deficits are and intentionally fix them. Now, this is the most challenging group for us. What about the group that had their penultimate year of graduate medical education last year and their final year of residency or fellowship training this year? In other words, say the general surgery resident whose second half of the third year, all of the fourth year, and all of the fifth year impacted by the COVID pandemic? Well, there are two possibilities for that individual. One is that they are going on to further postgraduate medical education in a fellowship, and the other is that they will be entering clinical practice and entering the continuing medical education phase of the continuum. And we need to look at them a little bit different, and we will in a second. So I'm going to lay out the challenge and the debt that needs to be paid. All of us, 
I mean all of us, faculty, staff, leadership, administration, are physically and emotionally exhausted by the pandemic and all that has been going on in the world over the last two years. Residents and fellows had been an integral and essential component of the medical profession's response to the pandemic, especially for the hospitalized patient. Collectively, we have met the challenges of the pandemic. Now we must understand the educational debt we owe to this next generation of physicians for their service and for our promise to the public, the public trust, the social contract that we have and enjoy in the United States. Now I'm going to give you a prioritization of need, but the prioritization is not necessarily a time prioritization. It's an importance prioritization. Uh, for, from a time perspective, but all of this needs to be done in the next few months. The first thing that needs to happen is you need to take care of yourself. You cannot help others if you are not sound. It is absolutely essential that you take care of yourself. The second is that we need to, to support and heal the faculty and the staff. This is a responsibility of the sponsoring institution, departmental leadership, and each of us individually, each of us has a role in helping each other get better and heal from what we've gone through. We need an assessment of the cumulative impact of the pandemic on the educational progress and the experiences of each of our individual residents, as well as our incoming PGY1 residents. And we need to prioritize this assessment. And I would say to you that the prioritization needs to go like this. The first is the class of 2022 and of that group, those entering clinical practice in 2022, July 1, need to be managed first, followed by those entering fellowship. Then the class of 2023, uh, in the sense of preparing the curricula and the schedules next year to fill the holes, based on an individual learning plan. And then we need to deal with the entering matriculates in July. Obviously there will be planning involved that will occur starting tomorrow uh, for those individuals, but that goes operational early July or late June. And then all of the other residents and fellows with two or more years of remaining in the program, I think we then over the course of the summer, have the opportunity to do the assessment and the individual learning pro plans that are necessary because they have more time to rectify deficiencies or broaden their experiential learning opportunities. Now we have been meeting with the ABMS boards and the member representatives and AOA certifying board representatives and we've reached a consensus and have a work have work going on right now on a toolkit for the transitions from residency to fellowship. That toolkit and the revised UME to GUME toolkit will be available on the ACGME website by Monday, April 18th, 2022. The tools are designed to support a framework of transitions that can be built upon in future years as we move towards a competency-based medical education framework. In other words, we hope to give you tools that will not be just a one time use tools, but they will be tools that you'll be able to build into your armamentarium in order to move towards a competency based medical education framework. One that will, uh, the need for which we have seen throughout this pandemic. So, what needs to be accomplished? You need a rational and candid assessment of the impact of the pandemic on each resident and fellow. For graduating residents and fellows, you need to ask the question, are they prepared to move on to the next level in the continuum? What are, what are the areas of strength? What are the areas targeted for further growth? And this critical question, do they require additional time in the program? At least 171 programs made that decision in the affirmative for at least one graduate last year, purely based on the impact of COVID last year. For continuing residents and fellows, how do we target and modify your subsequent experiences or their subsequent experiences to targeted areas to rectify areas for improvement or further development? 
you know, a little bit of detail about those entering practice, and this will be explicated extensively in the documents that we'll provide to you on April 18th or sooner. What about the responsibilities of the program? Well, it's important to create, complete a comprehensive assessment of the graduating resident this spring. And the, this is an important job for the Clinical Competency Committee, and it has to use a developmental mindset, mindset and not just look at the deficiencies, but needs to look at the entire portfolio of competency of the graduate to give them guidance about what they do well and what they need to further develop and what recommendations that they have for entering practice. You may consider a comprehensive exit assessment. You might put together simulation practice tests and other kinds of evaluations, oral examinations to uh, try and understand the competency profile along with the final milestone assessment because your overall decision about competency and fitness to enter practice really is broader than just the subset of milestone assessment. You need to accurately convey that assessment to the resident or fellow and reflect that on the final milestone evaluation. And you need to ensure the graduates are effectively connected to their certification boards and they'll tell you which board they want to apply to and how to continuing certification can support their transition. Now, it's important for the resident or fellow to do a comprehensive self-assessment, and we will helpfully be able to provide you with tools that will aid in that assessment. It needs to include an inventory of their actual clinical rotations, not just their schedule, but their modified schedule and the experience that they actually completed and those are rotations and electives that were not able to be completed. Now, the resident and the program director or an advisor, because in large programs, this will be very challenging to do solely with the residency program director. We need to review the program and comprehensive assessment assessment and the self-assessment of the resident and develop an individual learning plan to carry forward. And that individual learning plan is statistically most likely to be as they enter clinical practice, uh, but some of that may be prolonging for a few months additional education for additional educational experiences. And then the graduates need to proactively prepare for their transition. This is, cannot be a passive phenomenon. Now. They need to be strongly encouraged to identify a mentor for the next two years and identify an academic home or clinical practice advisor for continuing guidance on professional growth, and then actively engage with their specialty society to participate in continuing professional development materials, and also develop peer-peer interactions and support, which I think will be very important as they go through this with a cohort of colleagues. Now, for those going from residency to fellowship, uh, the receiving fellowship program, or the assessment and an individualized learning plan would be very similar to what I just outlined. But the receiving fellowship program director and advisor should meet with, uh, with the resident or the matriculating fellow before assignments begin to review the final milestones, the self-assessment, and the individual learning, learning plan. They should consider perhaps, depending on the size of the fellowship or the number of individuals with challenging circumstances, to consider a quasi boot camp or some other phenomenon during orientation for essential clinical competency development as needed uh, for the fellow to begin training effectively. And as I mentioned before, avoid an imprinting bias uh, of, of ability to be successful in the first few months of fellowship, because it may be more challenging for fellows coming from residency programs where significant COVID burdens were endured. And the next important step then is competency-based education. As I mentioned, uh, it would have been uh, uh, it would have been a gift to us had we been able to achieve a system of competency-based frameworks and evaluation and decision making uh, uh, prior to the onset of the pandemic. But the pandemic has taught us that we absolutely need to move to this level of evaluation and design of educational programs. So we are working with certifying boards at ABMS and AOA and with other partners to begin the process of looking to creation 
of a longitudinal over the continuum of medical education and a continuum of career competency-based framework for all over a lifetime of lifelong learning. Now, I think that this uh, graphic probably represents what you're thinking right now. Um, the original is every year the zebras get faster and faster, and of course, we're, the lion is speaking. But I think this year, every year in your mind, the ACG may ask us to do more and more. And I do re recognize that we are asking you to do more and more, um, especially for this graduating class. But they have done more and more for all of us, but especially the patients of the United States. And we owe them that debt of gratitude and that debt of responsibility as educators to prepare them as best we can for the future uh, which they face. But I ask you to do one more challenging thing, and that is um, we all feel this way, and I'm going to ask you to exercise your muscles, and I'm going to ask you to tie together one thread of the social contract, and then I'm going to ask you to tie together another thread and ask another friend to tie together another thread and start to pull on those and bring the frayed social contract together, because only if we try to do this together, will we get this done? Our society needs to heal as much as our educational programs need to heal, perhaps even more. We have a greater unanimity of purpose than perhaps society has right now, but we are part of society and we are a look to part of society and we need to knit this social contract together. Again, I wanna thank you, all of the DIOs, the program directors, the coordinators, the staff, your leadership, commitment, professionalism, your organizing, your support, and your protection of our residents, fellows, and faculty throughout this pandemic made it possible for all of us to survive and care for the patients we serve. I wanna thank you all, your residents, your fellows, and your faculty, your nurses and staff, for all you've done for those we collectively serve. Indeed, in this global society now, we serve all of humanity and our international colleagues, many of whom are on this session uh, in ACGMEI accreditation, uh, serve the populations they serve and reach similar challenges and have met similar heights of professional accomplishment. And we're grateful for all of your efforts. I leave you with just one phrase, much is yet to be done, but we're going to do it together. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a fruitful and enjoyable annual education conference with us here at ACGME. And I look forward to seeing you in person in the not too distant future uh, to resume the challenge of competency-based medical education and preparing the next generation to serve the public in a band of social trust. Thank you very much. Thank you.